Hi everyone, my name is Vera Chen and I'm a technical marketing engineer here at Sumo Logic. Let me introduce you to Brandon Mensing, one of our product managers for applications at Sumo Logic. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. On our agenda today, Brandon will start off with a live demo of outlier detection and predictive analytics. Following that, I will cover collection enhancements, including the beta app for Chef and content encoding support, then some details around the recent PCI certification, following that, an introduction to the app for Linux performance, the new Sumo Logic Com website, um, and we'll conclude with a question and answer session. So please go ahead and enter your questions in the chat box as the session proceeds, and we will address them at the end of the session. Great, thanks Vera. So I'll go ahead and talk about the outlier detection and predictive analytics. So this is a set of new operators. So you may have seen these come out in the, uh, the press release or our, uh, our monthly newsletter letter. So that was uh, released there in March. Um, and these allow you to stay ahead of your production issues in a couple of very important ways. The outlier operator allows you to do dynamic thresholding. So this is super important. You know those times when you've set a threshold that says, when I get 17 exceptions off of this one server, oh wait, no, 17's too small, let's make it 25. Wait, no, 75 per cluster, okay, just wake me up if it's on fire. Um, dynamic thresholds let you get around that by allowing the system to do the little you know, guest check revise work without having to set a hard threshold. So you're not picking a number, instead you're choosing a KPI, so you can be monitoring your response times. You can monitor an aggregate, such as the 95th percentiles response time. You can monitor the number of something, such as exceptions. And then you uh, tune some parameters, as we'll see. And um, you can even group by each environment or host dynamically. So just like our other aggregating operators, using the group by logic allows you to do this across um, a dimension of, of your data so that you can get a dynamic threshold-based alert where the dynamic threshold is specific to each one of your hosts or each geographic location or each deployment. The predict operator does a predictive analysis that is essentially a linear projection. So if you've ever worked with uh, Excel spreadsheet graphing and said project this in, you know, to the right, that's what this does. And the cool thing about this is that you can set a static threshold on that future value, that predicted value. What that means is you can you know, do some basic use cases like um, predicting when the disk is headed towards zero and then get an alert based on that. Or if the number of requests on a particular API is going too high, you can set a threshold on the predicted value of that. So we're going to talk through a few of the use cases here, and then I'm actually going to show you what the operators look like. Um, now, as Vera said, if there are questions, just go ahead and type them in um, to the, uh, the little box there on the webinar. Um, we'll try to address those toward the end. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to show you some more details on it if you have any questions that come up. Now, the use cases here are going to allow you to monitor a lot of different situations. So suppose you have um, input output by instance. You can actually, um, you know, use a outlier detection to monitor when there's an unusual fluctuation in that. In many cases, some of these, you'll have a sort of directionality to the change that you may care about. And I'll show you how you can choose that inside of the operator. So in this case, we might care about a burst in input output per instance or per geo. We can also get latency and response time by the type of transaction. We can look at semaphore wait times. Successful transactions processed per host or per database or per module. And again, this idea that you might do this per module, per um, API, per geolocation, much like anything else inside of Sumo Logic, if you're aggregating with a group by logic for a particular field, then we'll actually perform that analysis for each value within that field. So here we would be doing the group by logic by the host or by the database or by the module. You can also talk about the number of requests by the type of content. For instance, if you're looking at the, not, the type of request off of an Apache web server, maybe you're looking at the number of requests um, for a, P, a PHP page, or maybe the number of requests uh, by JPEG versus 
um, you know, movie files or something like that. Um, these can be ways of both identifying when there's an unusual search in traffic that indicates the need for maybe some operational work to expand the amount of capacity in a system. It could also be for those situations where you want to detect some sort of bad behavior that indicates either an intrusion or a distributed denial of service attack or other um, you know, pre-outage type conditions. So the goal here is to sort of get ahead of problems and get an alert when something is going awry rather than waiting until the, uh, the spike in traffic or the spike in exceptions. You know, those are usually indicators that pretty soon you're not going to see any traffic or any exceptions because the entire surface is going to be down. You can also look at latency by individual customer. So from a customer success or a business intelligence kind of perspective, this would allow you to keep an eye on whether or not um, you know, a customer's performance or um, their sort of perceived uh, you know, speed within the product is becoming slower. So this is a way to detect when um, maybe a dissatisfied customer might be um, you know, in need of some uh, you know, help with using the product or maybe they need, um, you know, there needs to be some provisioning on the back end with the DevOps team to make that work a little better. You can also look at the duration of queries on an individual database host. So you can find that one or two hosts that's actually getting hammered by one user and figure out what to do with that. You can look at your CDN's performance by geography. So this might help you understand if there's some sort of geographic specific surge in traffic. You can monitor outbound traffic from your hosts. So this might fall more into a security um, use case where you can understand if maybe data is leaving your network at a rate that you wouldn't expect. You can monitor the number of user logins on hosts or by user and host. So this might let you uh, identify if a particular host has a surge of logins, which might indicate an issue. So maybe every morning everyone's logging into a particular host and that's okay, but maybe on certain things like um, you know, total login traffic for um, your service or for a, an appliance or um, something like that, you might expect that you don't have a surge in logins unless someone's attempting to brute force that. You can monitor the number of bytes communicated by protocol or port or by host. This would allow you to say, look at the, um, the, a surge in traffic that might be associated with um, some behavior that needs to either be remedied uh, or maybe some service that needs to be shut down. Oh, and sorry, and that's, um, and that's the end of our use case. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into um, the browser here. And we're gonna take a look at, oh, I'll grab the wrong one. There we go. All right, so here we have a query. It's already run, and I'm just going to, um, oops, I've got the window a little bit too long here. Let me just fix that. The webinar caught me there. There we go. All right, so we have a query here, and this is actually out of our ELB app. And from this particular app, you might recognize um, some of this query. For those of you who are a little less versed in Sumo, um, don't worry too much about what all you're seeing here. I'll just explain the query for you a little bit. This is where I'm parsing out all of the fields in my ELB log. And this is using a very basic parse anchor like syntax. And I'm naming all of my different um, fields here. So I've got all the different fields from that standard log message. After that, I've got a time slice. And then I'm performing a couple of aggregates by that time slice. So here I'm looking at the average request process time, um, as well as the responses from um, the different parts of the service. And then the logic based on the, um, the way the ELB works says that the total process time is what I'm adding up there. And so if we were to eliminate this entire line here at the end and take a look at this output, this might feel a little bit more familiar, a little less hairy to look at this and say, this is the time and this is the total process time on average of all of the requests on my ELB server. So just like everything else you've done in Sumo Logic before, you can chart this sort of thing over time. So this is sort of the starting point. This is a great place to um, be to think about when do you want to use outlier or predict. When you're looking at a series of time, um, a, a series over time for your data, this allows you to um, you know, take a look at what's going on. And then the sort of classic thing that we could have done 
would be to set a threshold. So here we have the average request, um, the total process time here has jumped up to 0.9 seconds. And so in theory, in the sort of old school way of doing this, I might want to set a threshold that says um, if the total uh, process time on average jumps up over one second, then maybe I want an alert. But that may itself be misleading. Maybe what I really want to care about is um, the spike that causes you know, some issues with certain users. Um, maybe a one second response time for my application is okay because um, during you know, high traffic times, the response times slowly climb up and then they get up to two seconds and that's acceptable maybe for the particular application I'm running. So it really depends on your use case. But the point is that that static threshold might not be what I want. What I might want is something dynamic. And that's what Outlier can do for you. So here I'm going to bring back in the Outlier. And I'm just going to move this other part down here and show you that I'm just doing the um, two words, Outlier, and then total process time is my field name. So that's all I have to do. And if I click Start again, and I'm going to leave that on the line chart, and we're going to draw a special line chart here for the outlier detection. Okay, and you can see immediately like there's a couple of interesting things that happened here. So on the left side, first and foremost, we're dropping those results from the left side of the chart based on the window period of the analysis. So you'll understand this a little more when you start playing around with it, but the way that outlier works is that it actually analyzes a rolling window of data in order to come up with a rolling average and rolling standard deviations. And then we use those averages and deviations to create um, this uh, shaded light blue area that indicates the upper and lower threshold bounds for the outlier detection. So this is what we're doing in terms of creating the dynamic thresholds. So you can already imagine, for instance, that you might want to search back a little bit further. So we can say minus 2h, and we can look at the last two hours in order to make sure that we have a full view of the last hour of data. Okay, great. So now here I can see, for instance, that I had a jump in traffic that might be um, representative of an issue. So here, this data point is outside of the thresholds, and so it's considered an outlier, and here it's actually marked in the pink. And if we take a look at the table data to see what's really going on there, um, we can see what that really looks like. So I'm going to scroll forward here a couple of pages, and I can see that here in the indicator in the violation, I have a 1. And that 1 represents my data point here in pink. So what this means for you is that you can perform additional logic downstream of the outlier analysis. Now, what do these two fields mean? Well, total process time is the field that I ran the outlier on, and then that creates these two fields, total process time indicator, total process time violation. So an indicator is a point that lies outside of the thresholds. And then the violation is any point that meets any other criteria that are set in the optional parameters for outlier. And so it's those out optional parameters that I'm going to show you a little bit about here. And the reason is that if we take a look at this chart again, and we sort of scale it down a little bit more, in typical DevOps world, you might look at this chart and think, okay, that pink triangle, that's probably not an issue. What I care about is when there's a really big spike, okay? So the first thing that I can do is I can say, take this threshold here, which was a value that was sort of commented out. Um, this threshold parameter is going to change the number of standard deviations that are used above and below the average for each point in a rolling basis. And so basically what it's going to do is expand both up and down the light blue shaded area above and below the dark blue. And the dark blue, um, in case it wasn't obvious, the dark blue is actually my original um, uh, data series. So that total process time, that's in the dark blue still. That's the line, the, the line across the chart. So here I'm going to set the threshold to 5. And that threshold by default is 3. So that's plus or minus 3 standard deviations. And here I'm setting it to 5. And so I can run that query again. And we'll see how that changes my analysis. Great. So we can see that the light blue 
is a bit wider now. And so the data point that was previously considered a, um, an outlier is no longer an outlier. Okay, and there are a few other things that I can adjust here. So I'm gonna remove threshold. And so that will take me back to the situation where I have that outlier point that is um, outside of the thresholds. Um, and then I'm gonna say that I have a slightly different use case. So this time, I'm actually going to care about um, the consecutive data points. So um, in the case of um, uh, some DevOps use cases, what I might want to care about is not the situation where one data point has spiked, but instead I might care about the situation where multiple points in a row have um, gone outside of the bounds. So here I'm gonna write consecutive equals two. And the default is actually consecutive equals to one. And so let's actually take a look at the table of data in order to see what that looks like. So if I go forward a couple of pages, I can find that one here again, indicating that a point was outside of the line chart. And if I go and take a look at the data, I can see that here again. So here's the point that's outside of the chart, but this time it's not in pink. By setting the consecutive equal to two, I'm requiring that um, a violation is not indicate that, that, that a violation is not um, has not happened, an outlier has not happened, unless two consecutive points are outside of that threshold. So here I have an indicator set to one, but the violation is set to zero. Okay, and so we can see an instance if we reduce the threshold, we should be able to find an instance where two consecutive points are outside of that um, boundary. So here I'm gonna set threshold equal to one. So remember the default is three. And I can do multiple parameters here just by having a comma, and the space is optional, but I put a space for cleanliness. Okay, and so we should be able to see, and it does light up like the night sky. Um, here we have points all over the place. Let's make that a little bigger to zoom in. And maybe this sort of sensitivity um, is not exactly what you were looking for, but let's just pretend for a moment that um, this is correct. But maybe for your particular use case, and here we're talking about the total process time. So you might think of this as transaction process time or response time on an API. Um, typically, not always, but typically, you don't actually care if the response time gets better, right? So what do I do about these pink data points down here where it's actually gotten a lot better and it's marking those as maybe alert conditions that I, I would have to worry about? Well, we can change that. I'm gonna add another comma and I'm gonna say direction equals, and then I'm going to say either a plus or a minus. The default is both. And by setting plus, that means that I'm only going to get outliers where the points that are consecutively outside of bounds are above the line. So it's above the upper threshold. So I'm gonna run that again, and we should see a certain number of those dots disappear where those were actually below the lower threshold. So I'm gonna make this larger again so we can see that. Now I only have outliers that are above the upper threshold. And again, I can continue to change this so I can adjust the threshold. Um, another thing that may be a little counterintuitively I can adjust is I can adjust the time slice. So if you're familiar with uh, charting a lot inside of Sumo Logic, you can choose your time slice and your time range that you're charting by. And having a larger time slice here would actually indicate a bit of a smoother chart. So you can use that to adjust the granularity as well. And there is one more variable that I can adjust here. And that is actually the window of data that is analyzed in a trailing fashion for coming up with the rolling average and rolling standard deviations. So that is the window parameter. And by default, that's equal to 10. So here I could say I could make it equal to 20. And what that's gonna do, by the way, is increase the size of the data that's chopped off to the left, but it's also going to create a bit more smoothness in that light blue um, drawing on the back there. That's the threshold, the upper and lower threshold. And so that sort of smooths out that particular um, part of the, the analysis. So if you have data that's jumping around a bit much and you want the, um, or 
you, you, yeah, so if it's jumping around a bit much at certain times and you want the window period to be a bit longer, you can actually adjust that as well. So between all of these different parameters, you actually have the ability to um, hone in and sort of narrow down all of the noise. So the whole point here is that you want to make this chart um, during sort of peace times, you want to make this chart show up with no alerts, with no red or sorry, pink dots here, so no outliers. And then during war times, you would want to make sure that the query actually captures those. Because the next thing we're going to do so we're actually going to set up an alert on this. So if you're familiar with the way that our alerting works, it's based on a saved search that runs on a schedule. And if we go back and talk about that um, violation field here, so it's total process time violation in this case, that field name, and I'm going to copy that name here, that field name needs to be equal, that value needs to be equal to one in order for it to be considered an outlier. So what I'm going to do is say where total process time violation equals one. And now this isn't going to make sense as a, as a visualization anymore. Here, I'm just looking at um, minutes in time where the values are outside of the upper and lower thresholds, or in this case, just the upper threshold by two consecutive points. So what I can do based on this, and I could actually go back and set my threshold to higher in order to say that this is not an alert situation, right? Because this is a pretty tame looking chart. We might want to call this an alert. But what I can do here, if this were exactly the query that I want, is I could save this and schedule the search to run on a repeating basis. So keep in mind that that window period exists, and you'll want to have a search that runs for a little bit longer than the frequency. So here I might say every 15 minutes for a time range of the last 30 minutes, so that there's some overlap, um, since I have that uh, um, window, the default there is 10, and I'm running this um, with 10 minute time slices or one minute time slices, so that's a total of 10 minutes. Um, now, I did set that to a window of 20, so I might want to make sure that this is actually going to be going back 40 minutes in order to have overlap um, that covers the window in this particular case. Now, for your purposes with this large of a query, it might make more sense to do something like hourly for the last 70 minutes or something like that. Um, but you can sort of pick and choose and understand there. Now, if you did want a real-time alert, I'll show you one little trick in here. If you choose this little drop-down here, usually with real-time alert, we're suggesting to you to pick one of these values, but you can actually go back as far as the last 15 minutes. Um, because of that window period and the way we're doing in the analysis, um, for real-time alerts, you're likely only going to be able to focus on data that has a lot of data points and using a very small time slice. So for real-time alerts, you'll want to use a one-minute time slice or perhaps even a 30-second time slice in order to make sure that you have an adequate window period to create the right analysis so that you're not getting spurious alerts. Okay, now since I'm only processing for um, data points where um, the uh, violation field is set to one, what I will do here is I will say send a notification if there are more than zero data points, and I'm gonna have an alert sent, and I'll put my name in here in order to get that alert. What that'll do is it'll actually send me an email only when there's an outlier. So that's the sum of the logic that we're setting up here. Okay, so now let's go on and talk about the predict operator. And again, if you have any questions about the outlier operator, um, go ahead and punch those into the webinar now, and we'll revisit those at the end. So here again, I have my ELB requests. And I'm going to go ahead and drop the predict here, and I'm going to take a look at what this analysis is. Here I'm just looking at, and you know, full admission, this is very fake data. This is the number of requests over time. Okay, so here I expect to have a very flat prediction into the future. Um, but just as a starting point, again, you want to think about having a series of data over time. Now, the series of data over time, I can predict into the future with this predict operator by saying predict my requests. That's the field that I created. So if I look at this field here, that's requests. So predict the requests by one minute time slices 
with a forecast of 20 minutes. So that's 20 minutes into the future. So that's 20 times 1m. And there's some slightly different logic here. You could do two where you could actually set the forecast differently and all sorts of other stuff. So it's, it's all documented, but this is a good way to do it. So if I run that, then what I'll get here in the table view, as you can see, is I'll get my requests predicted as well as an error count to show me how far off it is for those individual data points. And then if I chart that, and it's not immediately apparent, um, the dark blue here to the right is the prediction. So if I were to be you know, a little bit more dramatic with this charting here, I could actually say predict 2,000 minutes into the future. Okay, And then we see that the chart data here um, going to the right, and I think it may have hit some, some maximums, so maybe it didn't actually go 2,000 minutes in the future, but you get the idea. You can actually choose a much more dramatic value if you would like. Um, and then here, what we're going to do in terms of the logic is actually think about this as um, setting a, a where clause or an if um, or setting up logic where we're referencing the requests predicted. So what that might look like, if we take a look at the largest value here in the predicted field, um, we get up to 137. If we take a look at the largest um, request, it's just 120, right? So what I can do is I can say set an alert um, based on a query that runs logic against that request predicted. So I could say where requests predicted is greater than 130. And so that's actually going to return, in this case, no uh, rows containing the original requests as a real value. It's only going to have those future values. And then similar to before, when I save this scheduled search, um, what I can do is say that the logic is to send me a notification only if there are greater than zero results. And so this is the, the um, alert condition that allows me to um, get an alert based on what the predicted value is. So I can very easily use this to take the predicted zero disk value coming up in the future. So if I have you know, 50 gigabytes free and then um, you know, 10 minutes later I have 45 and 10 minutes after that I've got 30, and then the predict operator will let you see that that trend is clearly towards zero and you can set a threshold based on the future value. Okay. Great, and before we move on, I do wanna jump back to one more thing with the outlier operator. This is sort of, you know, the PhD version of using the outlier operator, going even a step further. Um, so when you really get the outlier operator down and you know that you like it, um, and you know that you've got it tuned right, um, then you can go one step further. So what you can do here in the syntax, and I'm just gonna go ahead and drop this back down to something a bit more conservative and simple to read. So there's the outlier analysis that we'd seen a few times already. Now, let's say that I wanted to, I wanted to um, perform this kind of outlier analysis and receive an alert where I was looking at dynamic thresholds on a per geo or per host or per API or per customer basis. So remember all those use cases? You can do that here just by saying by and then you choose another field. So I might pick by method. Um, that's probably not the best use case, but um, I can do it by port. I can do it by client IP. In the case of ELB logs, it might not make the most sense to do this by any one of these. Um, I might have another field that I create based on this. But I can do this by each one. And you'll see that once you do this, you're, oh, I uh, forgot to average by that. So let me just copy that up to my um, aggregate here also needs to, um, sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't practice this one, but <laughs> we'll get it fixed here. All right, so my aggregate has to contain the additional field that I'm, I'm going to be um, performing the outlier analysis on. So that's why you saw the errors there, is that my method wasn't being passed through um, in subsequent things. Okay, so now I have the methods post, get, delete, and then um, on a per method basis, these numbers are actually all indicating um, outlier analysis for each one of those methods. So again, what I can do here, going back to the logic that we had down here with the where, 
let me make myself a little more space here. I can say again where total process time is equal to one, and that's going to show me dynamically only rows, only minutes in time where outliers have occurred, where the outlier is calculated based on a rolling window of average and standard deviation calculated per method in this case. So you can do that per host, per ge geographic location, per API. You can do this dynamically based on the field inside of CMO. Cool. And again, much as we said before, you can do um, a little bit of tuning here. So you can say threshold equals five and consecutive equals, oops, excuse me, it's consecutive equals two. Um, and again, direction and window are also options. And the goal here would be to create a query which returns no results unless the returned result is a part of an outlier that you would want to be alerted for. So in this case, perhaps, and you know, it's probably just fake data being fake data, but perhaps in this case, this might be a legitimate case where there's a surge in the number of deletes. So that might be worth looking at. Okay, so that is outlier and predict. As always, we'll tell you, go and take a look at the documentation, type in outlier into our handy dandy search window, and we've got lots of great information here to help you get through it and understand how best to use the outlier and predict operators. As always, if you run into trouble, just uh, shoot us a support ticket. I'll hand it back over to Vera. Okay, thank you, Brandon. All right, let's uh, continue on with uh, collection enhancements and uh, for configuration management and content encoding support. So let me switch back over to my presentation. So as all, you, uh, all of you know, Chef is a tool that enables you to automate how you build, deploy, and manage your infrastructure. So your infrastructure can become versionable, testable, and repeatable from the automation. Um, Chef users can create reusable definitions, recipes to automate infrastructure tasks, um, the recipes describe infrastructure and architecture and components and how each are deployed, configured, and managed. So, um, And people uh, install these clients per node on their physical servers, virtual servers, or even container instances. Now, uh, I just wanted to talk about a couple key use cases for the beta app for Chef. Um, so here are a few cases. Uh, you can view real-time dashboards containing Chef client runs and KPIs. Uh, you can view real time, uh, you can monitor application performance and troubleshoot continuous delivery and deployment issues. And you can also strengthen security through auditing user activity and configuration change activity. Now, if you're curious about the availability and how to participate, you can actually um, go ahead and reach out to um, Sahir and send him an email and you can actually participate and, and help us build out the application. I'll share with you a couple of the dashboards that we have available um, in the following slide. And this will be uh, targeted for availability in June. So let's go ahead and take a look at the beta app. Uh, there are two different dashboards available. We have one for the log-based um, chef report and one for handler based chef report. Let's take a look at them. So here you can see the fo following dashboard panels, um, hosts with potential filled runs. Um, you can see how many runs were started and how many actually completed. Uh, also um, error uh, or fatal count by host. And of course, this is just uh, some sample data put in here. If, if you had your own uh, chef logs, you could see all of the data across all of your hosts here. It, this is just a small sample. And additionally, you can see host count by cookbook, um, average run time by host in seconds, and run duration distribution. And now here for the handler-based logs, uh, you can see here updated resources over time, over here on the left, uh, run status over time. And this is interesting, um, top 10 most updated resources just to keep track of uh, 
which resources have been updated and um, you might find one that doesn't belong in this list and go in and it may, it may have experienced some issue. So you can go in and troubleshoot there. And here it's good to know which runs have failed. Um, you can go and uh, fix your configurations. So if you would like more information, go ahead and check our partner page on sumologic.com. And also, meanwhile, you can check out the Chef Cookbook on GitHub if you'd like to get started. Now, furthermore, uh, continuing on with con content encoding support, we now actually support UT UTF-16 and UTF-32. So that opens the world to um, like Microsoft uh, Windows applications such as SQL Server, SharePoint, PowerShell. Um, they write... They can write their logs in UTF-32 or similar formats. Now let's continue on to PCI DSS Level 1 certification. Uh, so recently, um, Sumo Logic actually remains one of the most thoroughly audited um, in the SAS analytics space. The latest version of the payment card industry data security standard 3.0 level one, which is for the largest merchants, became effective January 1st, 2015. Sumo is the Sumo Logic is the only provider in the analytics space to be certified by the latest PCI standards as of February 18th, 2015. Now, this comprehensive set of standards spans from security management, policy and procedures, physical security, network architecture, user access management, to credit card, uh, to network and systems monitoring and software development in order to prevent credit card fraud and data exposure through stronger data controls. So these standards require merchants and service providers storing, processing, or transmitting customer payment card data to adhere to strict information security controls and processes. So vendors now, um, from this new standard uh, 3.0 version, vendors are now also subject to have to demonstrate PCI compliance. So Sumo Logic has been very proactive in meeting this obligation. And in addition, many customers actually use Sumo Logic to meet their own PCI compliance requirements within requirement 10 of the DSS. So they actually use our PCI Sumo Logic um, application for PCI. Now, just to mention, uh, it's important to note that many SaaS providers out there today still have not subjected themselves to any third-party audits or assessments, but we are very aggressive on that front. We have SOC 2 Type 2 attestations, HIPAA compliance, U.S. EU Safe Harbor and U.S. Swiss Safe Harbor frameworks, and FIPS, FIPS uh, 140 compliance as well. And we're uh, continuing to venture into uh, more certifications on the roadmap. Now, continuing on to new app dashboards for Linux performance. The Sumo Logic app for Linux performance officially launched last week. It uses System Acti Activity Report, um, SAR, and Systat data to provide pre configured searches and dashboards to display information on your system's memory, CPU, and IO performance. Uh, this is a great way for you to view the overall health of your mission critical Linux servers. So I just wanted to give you a brief overview of how you can configure this to work for you. First, you start off with installing the sysstat package. Uh, then you need to adjust the frequency of the cron job to run every two minutes instead of every 10 minutes, which is the default. Uh, next, you can configure a Sumo Logic script source. And then simply install the Sumo Logic app for Linux performance. It just takes you know, a couple minutes. So in just a few minutes, you can then view a set of built-in dashboards, which we'll, uh, I'll show you. Um, following here. Okay, let's take a look at this. So uh, this Linux performance dashboard contains an overview of information ranging from the number of hosts, top 10 hosts, and their corresponding CPU utilization, memory utilization, queue sizes, um, and to also to which hosts might be in trouble by their property names, such as like mem, uh, memus, idle, um, average queue sizes, um, etc. So here you can see the number of hosts. Um, it displays the number of hosts in a single value chart for the last hour. 
Here you can see the number of uh, hosts in trouble. It provides details on hosts in trouble, including the property name, um, source host IP address, and the average memory used in a table chart for the last hour. And here you can see CPU utilization distribution. Uh, this is a display of information on your host CPU utilization distribution, and it's in a pie chart for the last 60 minutes. And of course, uh, you can take a look at the other panels available here as well. Now moving along to the next dashboard we have, this contains memory utilization insights. So here you can actually see hosts with high memory utilization. Um, it displays hosts with um, and into a column chart on the timeline for the last six hours. So uh, that's pretty useful. Here we have high memory utilization on outliers. Again, this is combined with the feature that Brandon just showed us, um, outlier detection. You can see outliers indicated here by the pink triangles in a combo chart on the timeline for the last six hours. And here, um, top 10 hosts uh, for memory utilization. It displays details about the top 10 hosts by IP address, you, the ones that use the most memory. And here it's in a bar chart format for the last hour. Continuing on, we actually have also a dashboard for CPU utilization. So here at the top, you can see the top 10 hosts uh, with high CPU utilization, and it's by IP address and by the bar chart for the last hour. And here you can see high CPU utilization on outliers. Again, it's great to see uh, the pink indicators here showing you where the outliers are. You can uh, troubleshoot your issues even further. And then here you can see top 10 hosts um, with high load averages. So it provides information on the top 10 hosts with high load average by IP address and a bar chart for the last hour. And if you want to continue on to the Linux Performance I.O. dashboard here, um, there are multiple panels. Um, you can just see. Let's take a look. Uh, top 10 hosts, what's the highest CPU time? So uh, you can see the highest CPU time during I.O. requests by IP address. And here you can see the highest amount of bytes written per second, and it provides details on the top 10 hosts with highest bytes and also by the IP address. And here, uh, top 10 hosts with high time for I.O. requests. And so, again, it's by IP address here. So it's a lot of useful information uh, collected in all of these dashboards. And if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, um, open up a ticket and you can get started. Download the, you know, just go and download and install the application. It just takes a couple minutes. And if uh, you have any questions, we, you know, I'm sure our customer service can assist you there. Let's take a look at our, a quick look at our new website. So in case you haven't visited our new website since the new design launched in February, here's a quick look. Um, so from user-friendly navigation to interactive content, the website delivers a beautiful new experience. Let me show you really quickly. So I like this uh, Sumo Logic applications page here. It helps me keep on top of the latest applications that are downloadable. And you can actually check off the boxes here, look at the ones that apply to you. It's really simple. Just come to our homepage and then go to learn more and click on applications. Now, also, the other section I like a lot is the resources section. So if we click on that, you can actually come here and uh, look for different webinars or customer testimonials, use cases that might apply to you, um, data sheets and white papers, anything you might like to look for, you can filter here in this um, little panel on the right. And also there are different categories that might apply to you. So this is how you can keep on top of our uh, latest releases and latest uh, documentation uh, about the product. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and address any questions that might have come in. 
questions. Cool. Yeah. So um, looks like we have a question about um, anomaly detection and how that relates to outliers. Um, so this is um, definitely interesting, and uh, you know there are a lot of different uh, tools out there and a lot of different capabilities. Um, and a lot of them have some overlap in terms of terminology with the idea of anomaly detection and outliers. So this can definitely be a little bit confusing. Um, our anomaly detection engine and product, um, those are all based on completely automated machine learning algorithms. So in the case of anomaly detection, you're not indicating what the format of a log message is. You're not um, trying to indicate what the KPI is. We're just automating the discovery of the log signatures and then monitoring the fluctuations and volumes of those log signatures. The fluctuation and volumes of log signatures are the basis of anomaly detection. So it's a fully automated way of finding unknown unknowns. Those are things that you just don't know about. And so that can be really useful for identifying something after the fact in terms of post-mortem, maybe identifying where the cause was, or even you know, in the middle of an outage, you may be able to find some information there. So it's a great discovery tool more than anything. So anomaly detection is very much about discovery. For um, outliers and predict, what we're talking about here is more along the lines of working with key performance indicators. These are pieces of data um, that you know and care about. So you know that you care about your response times, you know that you care about the number of requests or the size and bytes served by each server. And so these are pieces of data that you can track over time and outlier and predict are going to allow you to perform a concrete analysis of those particular KPIs. So because you know that you care about those particular KPIs, um, you're going to run the outlier or predict operators on them and set up your alerts. And what you don't know is what the correct, um, you know, uh, in the case of outlier, you don't know what the correct threshold is. So the sort of tagline of outlier, for instance, might be that this is the known unknowns. You know about the KPI, you don't know what the threshold should be, and that's what outlier will actually help you do. Okay, great, thanks, Brandon. Uh, we have another question too, and this is about whether Sumo Logic will introduce Ansible support for uh, configuration. And yes, I have this answer for you. Yes, that's correct. We have it on our roadmap, and we're also already working on it in beta. So uh, I don't have a release date for you yet, but you can reach out to us and uh, contact Sahir as well. He's actually managing this from the product perspective, and he has um, Ansible, Salt Stack, and Puppet um, in there as well for the rest of you uh, interested in more co configuration and automation tool applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to be clear, we'll, we'll follow up with the person who asked that question. But for anyone else who is interested, um, you know, you can get in contact with us and uh, we'll be happy to work with a, a select group of customers when the beta is available. Great. Thank you for joining today. Um, thank you, Brandon, for presenting with me. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.